All right. Again, welcome everyone to today's event, Your Vote Matters, Opinions of Young Voices in the 2020 US Election. My name is Marion Danseisen. I'm the Cultural Program Manager here at the German American Center in Stuttgart. And this event is a cooperation among the German American Center and the Landeszentrale für politische Bildung Baden-Württemberg. So on behalf of our director, Christiane Püker, my team and our colleagues at the Landeszentrale, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to yet another of our digital events. Please, um, as usual, allow me to say a few words about this event before I hand it over to our moderator and to our guests. So I'm sure many of you have followed the news yesterday and witnessed the inauguration of the 46th president of the United States of America, Joe Biden and of Vice President Harris. And while the political landscape is still very much divided in the US, we believe that it's important to listen to all sides, to hear each other, to constantly communicate in order to be able to understand one another, uh, even if we don't always agree, right? And so this is why we are privileged today to be able to talk to five young Americans about why they decided to vote in this past elections, what they expect from the incoming administration and so forth. Um, many young voters took their voices to the ballot box in the past election to make a difference and to have a say in what their future may look like. And so we are very excited to have five of these voices here um, that agreed to join us tonight. And so before I introduce our moderator, Jacob, who will then in turn introduce our guests, let me start by telling you what to expect from tonight. So our moderator will start by briefly introducing our five guests and will then be addressing them individually to ask them questions. And at the end, um, as usual, we want to include all of you at home as well. So um, you can use the Q&A or F&A button that you can see on your screen to type in the questions and we will try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of this um, event. So if you feel more um, comfortable asking these questions in German, you can of course do so and we will then um, translate them for our moderator. And um, if you feel like you want to address a specific person or a specific political party that is represented by these people, then please also mention that in your question so we know who to address directly. Okay, um, just so you know, um, for everyone at home, the chat function will be disabled and you will not be able to turn on your microphones or your camera um, during the event. So now um, let's welcome Jacob. So Pierre is the moderator of tonight's event. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> Hi, Maria. <laughs> so next to his actual job, um, Jacob partly works as a teacher at our institute and has supported us in many excellent projects past and present. And so being a rather young voter himself made him the excellent choice for this event. And we are so pleased that he agreed to join us and support us tonight. Um, just as a brief background, Jacob holds a um, bachelor's degree in secondary education and a master's degree in education. And um, he came to Stuttgart in 2018 and before that spent three years teaching US history and world geography in Illinois. So it's great to have you here with us, Jacob. And without any further ado, I'm handing it over to you to guide us through the event. Thanks so much. Excellent. Uh, super excited to have the chance to pick the brains of five young voters. Um, and I, my mission here today is for us to have a discussion, a fluid conversation from, from people that are going to have viewpoints on, on both sides of the aisle. And I'm super excited to see not only what I'm going to gain from it, but I think what, what our panelists and our viewers will too. To give a little framework before we get started officially, and I introduced uh, the panelists, I wanted to give a, a brief kind of outline of, uh, or overview, if you will, of some of the topics that we'll be covering. Uh, first, I wanted to take a look back to the election, uh, look at some of the results and see the impact of, of young voters uh, on uh, when we're analyzing it for the election perspective. 
Uh, we will uh, touch on a few topics or specific issues that are important to our panelists and, and try to get some feedback on what that will look like. And then obviously we can take a look forward as well. We're, we're about 24 hours post uh, inauguration uh, of, of President Biden. And so we'll have a chance to look and see what uh, the panelists uh, are, are looking for as we move forward. So that's a, a brief outline. And I wanted to now introduce uh, who will be joining us and, and having a great discussion tonight. Uh, first, we have Chris Elmore. Chris is a, a senior from Carmel High School in Carmel, Indiana. Um, started in politics when he was just 15 uh, and uh, recently earned the position uh, of executive director, uh, director uh, for Hamilton County in Indiana. So Chris, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. We also have uh, Priya Panda. Uh, she is a proud New Yorker from Queens, uh, spent her career on nonpartisan and get out the vote outreach as well as voter protection. Um, also spent some time in Germany. She served uh, in the Congress uh, Bundestag as a youth exchange fellow. Priya, thanks so much uh, for taking some time today. Uh, we have Grant Peeler. Uh, Grant currently serves as a civilian consultant for the U.S. European Command's Public Affairs Department here in Stuttgart. Um, he has worked in a lot of different roles in the public domain, uh, including various capacities across the European landscape for the U.S. military. So Grant, thanks for taking some time. We have Anna Irvine, who's joining us. Uh, she lives in Munich. I think she's actually in Ohio right now, but I, lives in Munich. Uh, she is a program coordinator uh, on the social innovation team for Steelcase. Uh, they're focused on uh, social impact and leveraging business as a force for good. She's been all over the place. Spent some time in Baden-Württemberg as an English uh, teaching assistant. Um, spent some time in Berlin working for a nonprofit and even has volunteered in Bolivia. So Anna, thanks so much for joining us. And last but last, uh, not least, we have Ella Taylor. Uh, Ella lives in Florissant, which is a, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Proud St. Louis and here myself, Ella. So excited to have you. She is a, a senior at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, studying political science. Uh, she's currently going through the process of applying for law school after graduation. So uh, Ella, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Let's dive right in. We got a lot to cover. We got the introductions over with. Uh, so let's, I, I wanna start here. Uh, I wanted to first look back at the election and for us to kind of see the impact of the youth vote. And so for our, our viewers at home, when, when we're categor categorizing the youth vote, we're specifically talking 18 to 29. So I'm gonna, you're gonna hear me echo that a lot as we have our conversation today, but specifically, in regards to the youth vote, that's kind of the, the age breakdown that we're looking at. And when we look back at the election in 2020, we saw 52 to 55% of youth vote uh, in the election. To give you some comparison, we had around 42 to 44% in 2016. So depending on where you're getting uh, the information, anywhere between an eight and maybe a 12 or 13% increase um, in the youth vote. To set the stage for our first question, 61% um, of the youth vote went in favor of Joe Biden. And so what I wanted to start with is we have a group of people from all over the place across the United States and, and Grant still being in Germany. So I wanted to take a chance and give our viewers an inside look at where you guys are from and how you think the youth vote impacted your particular area. So Chris, I wanted to start with you. Uh, so Indiana is a, a tad bit of an outlier in that we saw 61% of youth vote in favor of Biden. But in Indiana, um, we saw youth vote favor Trump, 51 to 45%. So I, I wanted to ask you, from your perspective as someone in Indiana, um, what about the Republican Party? Or, or maybe Trump resonates with the youth vote um, from your experience, whether it's in Carmel or maybe a, a larger uh, examination of the state uh, as a whole. 
Well, I think that in areas like where I'm from, Carmel, suburbs of Indianapolis, I think it did lean more towards Democrats among the youth vote, but that's because we're in an urbanized area anyway. But when we look across the entire state, there is a lot of rural Indiana outside of Indianapolis. And when you go into those areas, they tend to lean more conservative uh, because that's really the way they were raised. And when you have lower voter turnouts in those areas in general, it turns out that just the youth who wind up turning out there are going to go for President Trump. Now, the only other thing about that is Vice President Pence obviously uh, lived in Columbus, Indiana beforehand. So that's another rural Indiana area. He arrived back home yesterday, or I think he arrived home yesterday. So I think they had a home court advantage here. But I think that the important thing is that, yeah, Indiana went for Trump but it didn't go so heavily Republican as people had thought. In, in the area that I'm in, in particular, we had a, one of the top 10 U.S. House races in the entire country, Victoria Sparks defeating Christina Hale, uh, Indiana 5th Congressional District. Uh, 538 national pollsters all rated in toss-up. The DCCC, which is the Democratic Party's fundraising arm, dropped millions of dollars uh, for Christina Hale. Uh, but they ultimately uh, lost that that race. But uh, pollsters thought it was going to be between two and four percent. It was a 52 percent chance that Victoria Sparks was going to pull it off. And this is in a uh, historically a reliably Republican district. So things are absolutely changing in Indiana, I think. Uh, and I think that while Republicans have the advantage right now on a statewide uh, range, we uh, President Trump probably should have secured the youth vote by more than you know two six uh, percent when it comes down to it. Okay, interesting. So we get the perspective from from Chris in Indiana. So let's now jump. I want to jump to you, Priya, um, as someone who's a proud New Yorker from Queens. Uh, the the youth vote uh, in your particular state kind of more matched national averages for Biden. We saw 60% of the youth vote in New York was in, in favor uh, of, of now President Biden. Um, what are your initial thoughts or in looking back, what are some of those things that you feel like resonated with, with the youth vote in New York? Uh, one thing that, you know, feel free to comment, but I think of, you know, a strong young, uh, like an AOC or someone like, you know, that has a really strong impact on you. So I'd love to hear your take on, on what you felt uh, inside of New York. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to share those thoughts around that. I think to start off, one interesting thing to observe just in general, looking at the increase of youth vote, especially during this election, is how particularly the expansion of vote by mail, early voting programs, no excuse absentee really was able to facilitate such an increased level of participation, especially in New York. So early voting in the state of New York is actually fairly new. I think 2018, maybe 2019 was the first year that we had early voting. And this was especially important in the pandemic to give people more options to be able to vote in a safe and accessible manner, whether it was coming in person those few days before election day to vote or maybe requesting an absentee ballot. ballot. I really think that those factors really played a role in increasing the youth vote and making it higher because now younger people who may be dealing with, uh, they live on a college campus, but they're registered to vote in their home community and that they don't necessarily know where, the, where to vote. They have more options on how they can participate in elections and having those additional options just made it a lot easier for young people to be able to prioritize getting out in our democracy a lot more. So I think just in New York State alone, those expanded options, and I'm sure elsewhere really helped facilitate the youth vote. And I think it's no strange or anomaly that New York is a safe blue state. We do have a big majority of Democratic voters. So it doesn't surprise me that a lot of younger New Yorkers voted for Joe Biden. And I think another really interesting thing to keep in mind, especially with the youth vote in New York City is the population of young people of color that are there that are voting. I think it's really important to uplift them, especially in light of COVID. New York was really seriously hit with COVID-19 early on in the pandemic, we were the hotspot for COVID and a lot of people were losing their jobs, having to step in to take care of their family, restructuring their lives, really dealing with a lot of upheaval as a result of the pandemic. And I think the way the pandemic paid out and perhaps the lack of support from this administration to get people the necessary relief they needed for COVID really played a role in 
helping decide how young people voted. And then I'm sure, you know, just as speaking as a voter myself, I know a lot of people care about student debt cancellation. That's an issue that's in a lot of people's minds, racial justice issues. Um, oh my God, there's just so many issues that sure, people sure. are interested in voting. So I think um, COVID was definitely a big role in pushing that turnout. But I also think just the expanded options in general really have pushed people to want to come out and vote in higher numbers. And like you mentioned, AOC, yeah, like New York City, especially. So I think it's really important to keep in mind some of the differences of New York. And people don't realize that New York State is not just New York City. I've lived in New York City and I've gone to college in upstate New York and there are definitely differences of course with the urban rural divides the political divides there as well um, so there's definitely more of a progressive I guess a more structured progressive voice I would say in New York City but that's not to say that upstate New York and the rest of New York sure. doesn't have progressives out there I think a lot of upstate New York needs to be organized better. And I think we're really seeing the results of that progressive and strong organizing starting to come to fruition with the way that people are turning out. Okay, interesting. Um, so Indiana, New York, Anna, I know you're, you've spent a majority of your time um, recently in Munich in Germany, but Ohio was interesting because Trump wins Ohio 53 to 45 uh, but when we specifically get into the youth vote, uh, it, there's a switch, 54% uh, in favor of Biden. And so I, I want, I know you haven't, again, you've spent your time in, in Germany, but was there anything that stuck out to you when you were speaking to people, uh, you know, in our age bracket that they were like, yeah, this is why I'm going out. These are the reasons why I, I'm voting. In particular, do you have any insights on what you may think be the reason why we see a shift from that general in favor of Trump to the youth vote in favor of Biden. Sure. Well, it's, it's difficult to say because I honestly was, was shocked that Trump won with the margin that he did. I was kind of hoping that Ohio would swing in the other direction this time around, as most of you know, um, Ohio is a swing state. Um, and, but the last two elections Trump did, um, did win Ohio. Uh, but I think what's unique about Ohio and maybe compared to some of the other Midwestern states is that we do have three large, larger cities and metropolitan areas. So you've got Cincinnati, Columbus and Cleveland, which attract a lot of younger voters, younger people, a lot of big universities in these cities, um, Ohio State for one, where I went as well. And I think you have then these conglomerate groups of um, more active um, also college educated younger voters who might not have voted in the 2016 election, but now are of age um, and able to vote and have been very motivated by a lot of the social reforms and issues that have been going on um, the past couple of years, especially. Um, and I think also just to echo a bit of what Priya said um, about the young vote of color as well in Ohio, I recently saw that there are about 400,000 younger people of color who um, are able to vote. And I think that probably swayed the vote um, for the youth in the direction of Biden. But I do think there's still not enough youth representation in Ohio, just looking at the numbers in comparison to how many youth voted to, to the older population and the, um, the influence that it did have on the, on the outcome. So I'd say, Probably the social issues when I, when talking to people are, are the most um, most prevalent right now. Of course, the economy and COVID, um, but just really when it comes to whether it's Black Lives Matter or LGBTQ rights, um, from a lot of people that I've gone to school with in Ohio, those are some of the more pressing issues and what got people voting um, in 2016 and especially uh, this past election. Great. Thanks for the insight. And, and, to, and to echo both of you, I mentioned at the top 61% of all youth vote favored Biden. If you just bracket that down and we're looking at minorities, those numbers get even higher, almost closer to 80% in favor of Biden. So to kind of support what you're saying, Anna and Priya, what you said about New York, it's definitely scaled out across the entire country as well. That we're seeing almost a 20% you know, jump when we're you know, spe uh, specifying um, the minority vote. Ella, as I, you know, someone who I lived in St. Louis uh, for several years, uh, the state of Missouri is super unique because um, Biden won the youth vote in, in Missouri, 
but by a very small margin, 50 to 46 percent. Um, and so I was curious, like, what were you hearing, seeing from your particular community and where you're from and what was kind of driving that? And again, you know, Missouri's unique because it's, you have Kansas City and St. Louis and, and those are big democratic strongholds, but you have a lot of rural areas too. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on kind of what you were hearing and some of those issues that you think maybe were the reason that tightened it um, in that particular state. Yeah, I um, hope you guys can all hear me okay and everything, but I would definitely say that St. Louis City, Kansas City, and they're on like complete opposite sides of the state, but I would even go as far as to throw in Columbia, Missouri, um, which is where Mizzou University is. I would say all three of those kind of helped to play a role in why the youth vote leaned more Democratic than Republican. Um, Kansas City and St. Louis obviously being such major cities as far as Missouri goes. I mean, obviously, they're not on the scale of New York City or, or Los Angeles or anything like that. Um, but you do see a lot of younger people move to Kansas City and St. Louis when they graduate college. Um, typically, those are going to be the people that are just from going to college or like how they grew up already have those Democratic leaning preferences. Um, they are on board with the policies and stuff like that. And I think that when you look at St. Louis and Kansas City, you're getting a lot of the Democratic vote from, from those two cities in particular. And then if you go as far as to throw in Columbia, whereas the majority of the rest of the state is maybe not super, super Republican, but definitely leans more Republican than Democrat. Um, but then you start to get into... Um, like me, this was my first presidential election that I was eligible to vote in because of my age. So I think taking into account all of the rural communities in Missouri, um, you have to look into age, like, are they eligible? Are they registered? Um, even go as far as are they informed? Like, do they even like follow politics? Um, I think that's a big thing in Missouri is if you're not in the city limits, you really kind of turn a blind eye to politics. Um, like there's that, like Priya said with upstate New York, there's that rural urban divide really heavily in Missouri. Um, I know for me, I go to a very liberal arts college and the entire campus pretty much felt like they were, even the ones from out of state were very hardcore um, Biden supporters, democratic supporters. Mm -hmm. We had even, um, before this election, we had Democratic senators speak on campus. So I think just being in St. Louis, um, you see the, we've obviously had the Ferguson riots in 2014 with that police involved shooting. And then three years later, we had the Jason Stockley verdict come out where that was another police versus the black community. And I think um, those kind of events over the course of a young person's lifetime, seeing how the city reacts, how Washington DC reacts, really swayed how people started to view politics and what policies they started to get on board with. And I would say that's probably why we saw, um, at least in St. Louis, uh, a heavier Biden supporting community. Okay, uh, and I would agree too, you know, being from that area, there really is that urban rural divide, you know, even just, 30 minutes outside of St. Louis, you get a totally different perspective. And, and that's, you know, I think common across the Midwest, I'm sure, as Chris mentioned, uh, in Indiana, and even Anna said in Ohio, we're all kind of from that Midwest area where you get those big divides. Um, Grant, you have an interesting perspective that I'd like to, to, to maybe pick into here a little bit. You've spent a majority of your time in Europe um, over the course of the last few years. And so not having like a you know, a, a place that I wanted to be able to, to, to push you from. I wanted to pick your brain a bit about, did this election feel different in the run-up? Um, and as we actually got into the results, from, from your perspective as someone who's spent a majority of your time in Europe, what did you see or what were you, uh, you're hearing, what, was there anything different? You were like, yeah, this one feels maybe even different than 2016 or, or any other election you've been a part of. That's a really good question. Um, from my perspective, I've 
observed both of the campaign seasons from overseas. The first campaign in 2016, when um, former President Trump ran against Hillary Clinton, I was stationed in the Balkans. So I was in Romania, Bulgaria, bouncing around in Eastern Europe. And so the 2020 campaign season, I spent entirely in Germany. Um, thank you, coronavirus. <laughs> we weren't really moving around too much. Um, and so it, it, was it was definitely different in and of itself, the two campaigns but also observing them from a Western European country versus an Eastern European country. And I actually, I observed the campaign from the EU in the 2020 season, but I participated in the election from my hometown in Buffalo, New York. So to get back to Priya's kind of the upstate New York, or we call it Western New York from Buffalo, <laughs> where you, you really do, you know, it's a, it's a big blue dot of a city and then it's a lot of red out in the country, but mm. it's not, it's not always just the, uh, you know, I think people from the city think it's the city and then the rest of the state. I think in, in Buffalo, I observed a very significant um, Albany versus Buffalo. Um, there was a, you know, the, the city, but also uh, Governor Cuomo. And so seeing how state politics affects the local area was very interesting. When I was on the ground during the election, and then it kind of seemed like the election went on for a whole month. But um, being in Europe, watching this thing unfold from the beginning of the campaign seasons, um, it seemed a little bit different this time. It, it almost seemed like last time it, it was very much of firsts. It, it almost seemed like it was a reality TV show and people were watching it and it was entertaining. And I think this time around people had seen something similar to that play out before. And so it was a different, people were watching it with a different lens. Um, we have four years of context to apply everything that happens. Um, and I think that, that was part of the reason why it unfolded the way it did in 2016 and part of the reasons why it, it did the same in 2020. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure most of our viewers on this channel are German and I think Germans are very critical period, like about everything, but even specifically about um, the United States administration, what we do in America specifically, you know, back domestic issues, but even what we're doing over here, specifically being part of the military community over here, um, it's, I used to play a game driving to work where I would turn on the radio and listen to the morning news and see how long it could go before they talk about President Trump or Trump, the United yeah. States or something. And you, I don't get out of Bad Constat, like we're not across the river into Stuttgart yeah, yeah. yet, usually. And um, it, it's interesting because, you know, we're talking about the demographics and the youth vote in a lot of these areas. And I think in, in Stuttgart, I can't provide you a great breakdown um, because I think most of the youth out here would be either dependents of service members or like younger service members that fall into that under 32 category. And so this would be like junior, junior enlisted and junior officers serving overseas, um, living in Europe. And I know, um, I know a lot of people voted and I've been the voting, I can't remember what it's called, Federal Voting Assistance Program officer mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. before and had to like help people register and get their ballots. So, you know, for the people in the military community, it's, it was very much the same as normal, like you, you vote by mail. Um, mm. But it seemed even observing kind of on social media, the people back home. And then when I finally, you know, we took our trip back home for the holidays and saw how people were actually doing these things. You know, I kind of sat down and I was like, I've, I've never heard of people voting early. I didn't know you could. And I know yeah. the laws are different in every state, but it, it seemed like I voted on the election day and I felt like I was way late. And I was like, am I doing this wrong? And so that was another thing I noticed. Um, but one, one thing I think specifically on the topic of youth, uh, I think in Europe, the youth movements, they care more, they care broadly. You know, I've seen, I've seen the, the climate protest marches in Stuttgart and it's, it's, these are kids just leaving school in the middle of the day and marching through the city, but there's adults there too. It's, this is not, you know, it's not Greta Thunberg by herself. It's, it's a global movement. And these are things that politicians are taking note of. And I think it's, it's interesting for me to see that kids at younger ages, I think in Europe are getting more involved in caring more about things that I remember caring about when I was in middle school or high school. Sure, sure. It's encouraging to me because these are the people that will be the youth voters soon. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, consider that uh, our little trip around the globe here as we got some perspectives from all over. Um, but I do wanna dive into some specifics um, on the issues. So I wanted to give you guys some context first. I was interested to do some, some research into the top issues that drove youth to the polls. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to give those guys to you. And I'd love just to kind of hear your thoughts. If those kind of match what you were anticipating, or maybe you were, you would have thought something completely different. So according to the data, I'm just going to read them as we go. I'll give you the topic. And then um, again, to, to make sure I'm clear, these were the top issues um, that drove youth to the polls. Okay. So in relation to coronavirus, 42% of Biden uh, supporters said that that was their number one issue to Trump's 21%. Racism, 21% of Biden youth vote said that that was their top issue to Trump's 7%. Climate change, 12% of Biden support, uh, youth vote said that that was their top issue to Trump's 3%. Here, I think, is a good, really good insight. Uh, if we bracket just economy and the jobs, so I know that that's very broad. I mean, probably too broad. But if we're just uh, speaking on the economy and jobs, 8% of the youth vote who supported Biden said that that was their number one issue to 41% of Trump voter uh, youth vote said that that was their top issue. Um, they did throw in the categorization of women's choice. As well, 1% of the Biden vote said that that was their top choice to 9% of Trump's um, supporters said that that was their top issue when they went to the uh, went to vote. Chris, do those numbers uh, accurately reflect what you experienced in Indiana or maybe uh, with, with what you were aligned with and what your concerns were? Yeah, I mean, that totally makes sense to me and all the conversations that I've had. So I'm also the chairman of the Indiana High School Republicans. So there's 15, uh, I think we're at 16 clubs now statewide. We're all a part of one uh, corporation from, uh, that we organized last year, but I'm statewide chairman. So I have conference calls with all of our club presidents. So I kind of get a multitude of perspectives from all across the state, even though I'm in central Indiana, right? Very urban. I like to get the perspectives from the rural areas and almost every number you just said makes total sense to me. Uh, I think that with, in relation to COVID, I don't think it's uh, that easy to separate the economy from COVID. I think that people were, were Republicans were definitely worried about how does the economy come back after COVID is over? Who would we trust more to bring it back? Would that be president Trump or, uh, or a president Biden? And so I think that when they were faced with that question, they picked the Republican most of the time. Uh, so I think that that was definitely the biggest issue to the youth as well. Um, but I, I mean, I think beyond that, I think that, I mean, I, I don't know about, I, I think that racism was still an issue that young Republicans cared about. I don't think it was their top issue I, I, because I think that in the context of the time, they're more worried about how are we going to move on after this? How are we going to come back together? How are we going to unite around an economy? And so, I mean, I think that in the minds of young Republicans, they're thinking, let's go ahead and move on with this current crisis and address that one next time. So, and, and you know, I'm not a Trump supporting Republican. I'm a very moderate Republican, very fiscally conservative, very small government. And I, from the conversations I've had, uh, it seems like most Republicans know that the divisiveness that President Trump has caused is likely not going to be uh, the way that we are able to, you know, have an act, take huge action on racism. These are issues that are going to be uh, taken down over time. But in the next two years, three, four years, I think they were mostly more confident to put their confidence in President Trump to rebuild an economy. Because I think from their perspective, if you don't have an economy, every other issue is just is just irrelevant. So sure. I, I don't think that when you say 7% of, Re of Republicans, racism was their top issue, or I think it was 7%. Yeah, you yeah you're right. That, yeah, right? 7%. Yeah. Right. I don't think that that means it's unimportant to them. I think that yeah. they were prioritizing different things for the context of the time. Yeah. And I think that that's probably important, Chris. It's a great point. You know, most of the time when some of these polls are conducted, you're just given a flat sheet, right? And you're saying rank, you know, list these one to five on level of importance. So, you know, I don't think it was probably a blanketed way. It's an important point that you made there, Chris. I, I, I And I think it's um, a valid way to look at that, as you could say, you know, it doesn't mean that that's unimportant. Sure. It's just that in the comparison of what they valued highest on a scale of one to five, they selected 
the economy and jobs. So Chris, thanks for your Well, in, sorry, there. one one more thing. Yeah, I mean, fine, yeah. for example, context on that point. So when the death of George Floyd happened and the BLM protests started all over the country, I had a conference call with my executive board for high school Republicans and we started uh, the Lincoln Initiative for our last year uh, of uh, being in our respective offices. And what it is, is we're trying to put together a program to promote diversity within the Republican Party, make minority vo voices heard so that when we're trying to reform the party into the future, we can take those uh, opinions into account. But I would not, I, I still would not say that racism was my top issue during, it, it's obviously a very clear issue to me and I want to address it, but I would have still said that the economy was my top issue during this year, but it doesn't mean that I don't care about yeah, the sure. issue. And I think that's, I think that's the mindset most Republicans were in this year. Okay. Priya, um, I just was curious, such a big discrepancy on those economy and jobs. Like we just said, 41% of the youth vote saying the economy and jobs uh, is the most important issue, issue for them. Any ideas or, or, or thoughts on how there can be such a large discrepancy? Yeah, and I think it really goes back to the point Chris was making about how some voters really see COVID and the economy as being linked and you can't have, you can't have COVID relief without taking economic considerations into account and you can't consider you know, taking care of the economy without controlling the pandemic. So I think, that definitely um, also came into play with a lot of young Democratic voters, but I think perhaps in more so of a reverse way. So rather than prioritizing the economy, they were prioritizing our first thing really needs to be addressing COVID and getting that spread, getting people relieved so that they can safely stay at home, getting people rent relief, mortgage relief, ending evictions and everything and really addressing that from addressing public health as being a way that you strengthen the economy and that we can't have and reopen the economy safely unless we're really tackling those key public health concerns first. And I think also looking at the issue of racism, the way that I personally see ra racial justice when I vote is it's more so of a lens for me that I kind of apply to all issues. And I'm sure there's lots of Democratic voters who will do the yeah. same will be like, okay, I care about COVID and the racial justice um, lens is really important and valuable to me, or I care about climate and reproductive rights and racial justice within that is also something I'd like to see prioritized. So I would say, you know, I think going along with what, what Chris said, you know, it really depended on where people's heads were at the moment, especially when you're ranking things on a survey like this. But I would imagine that there's lots of folks that are really interlinking these issues and really keeping in mind that I want my COVID response by this administration to prioritize racial justice. I want us to think of all the black and brown people that uphold our economy that have been impacted by COVID and desperately need relief and need to get their jobs back. I'm going to think about black women and rural women that are impacted by reproductive rights issues. So I think those lenses can really be applied across a multitude of issues, but I think going back to Chris and yours's point earlier, I think people, it really depends on where people see the economy and COVID standing as like more of a chicken and egg situation, like which sure, one sure. do we want to approach this from a public health standpoint and address public health concerns and then use that as a segue into addressing economic concerns and hope that addressing public health concerns will generate a stronger economy or do we want to prioritize sure. the economy before we do that? And I think that that's probably an important point to make, right, is it really does depend on how those people are viewing those uh, across the lens of all those different issues. I think that that's a really valid point for you. And, and one thing I wanted to kind of pivot here a little bit is um, we're focusing on the youth vote and, and we're getting into some of these topics and where they rank. Um, I wanted just to ask you guys, you know, you've heard those numbers now. Anna, like are, from your perspective, um, are you seeing any differences between what you think is important versus maybe say your parents or your grandparents or, you know, an aunt or an uncle that you're involved with? Is there a big gap between what you're prioritizing and what they're prioritizing? Well, I'd say, so with my immediate family, um, we're all, we're Democrats, we're quite liberal. Um, and I do have though a handful of family members who live in, more rural areas, um, Eastern Ohio, and live um, on a farm 
they're farmers. That's that's their the way that they they get their income and that's their way of life. And I have definitely noticed a trend toward um, or a very different trend to what's important to them versus what's important to um, me or my parents and siblings. Um, and that being said, we I grew up in Franklin County, which not in the city of Columbus in a suburb, but it's still predominantly um, a blue area. It did vote for Biden. Um, the suburb I grew up in, though, is is more conservative in general. So I've seen kind of a, a bit of both ends of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would I would echo, I think, what Chris said, as well as this word economy that's often tied to a lot of, quote, conservative values or people who ch- tend to vote Republican. Um, my question is, when a lot of those people do say um, the economy was the driver, um, like what what the definition to, of economy means to them. Sure. I think a lot of it gets tied to taxes, right? And people who just don't want their taxes raised and that's their driving issue. Um, but I think people in my family as well, I mean, probably appreciated the, the subsidies that Trump provided for the farmers, um, these kinds of things. They also aren't as aware um, about COVID necessarily. I'm sure they have had people who've either been... Um, been hospitalized or been afflicted by the virus, but there isn't like as much mask wearing going on in the rural areas of Ohio from what my family told me, right? Um, So I'd say in in that sense, the numbers do make sense that people who, from my side of the family that would vote for Trump are not saying Corona is their top issue, um, but more so focusing on um, this, this quote, economy. Um, mm-hmm. issue whatever that means and yeah, yeah. just as, as a side note I, I I was a bit surprised by the numbers you read um, I think of course like Priya and Chris both said you have to choose one so it could be dependent on you know what people just were prioritizing as that first choice and the other issues might be you know right there up up there with them but um, hearing that the low numbers for, for choice uh, or a woman's right to choose was was surprising to me just because I feel like that is an issue that's talked about so frequently um, at least in the media and the channels. Well, sure. That I mean, yeah, the recent, yeah, recent. Uh, when we were talking about the Supreme Court, that was kind of, you know, the 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 main talking point across all media, uh, you know, outlets was was that. So, I, I I agree with you there. I was a bit a bit surprised too. I, I wasn't necessarily so surprised to see that the numbers were higher for 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 Trump supporters. Um, that that was their number one issue, but but surprised. Uh, I guess it's just kind of a sign of the times, right? You know, there's probably <laughs> so much you, you just are yeah. what's in front of your face, um, yeah. which is sure. interesting. And I think um, just a quick uh, note there too, is just having been living um, in Europe for the past couple of years, this is a topic um, that's also spreading throughout Europe and gets talked about on European news channels um, with right to choose or abortion um, being legal in certain countries. Um, so I think I'm influenced by that a bit as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that was shocking to me. Yeah. Okay. Ella, um, maybe look at it through the lens of, are you seeing any differences? Um, well, I guess the first question I'd have to ask is, you know, are you seeing big gaps in, in your beliefs and what your parents' beliefs are? are you know, are there are, most of the time in the United States, not all the time, but we see a lot of generational party affiliation. So, you know, obviously if a parent is a Republican, a lot of times we do see that their, their, their child will, will fall into that same category. Ella, is there anything that sticks out that maybe you're valuing that your, your older, um, you know, parents, grandparents, relatives, whoever, uh, may not be putting so much of an emphasis on? Um, yeah, I will start off by saying that my parents were actually, I'm a Republican. Um, my parents were actually members of the democratic party up until the 2016 election. Um, and they were the kind of Democrats where you couldn't talk them out of being a Democratic voter. Um, and obviously in 2016, I wasn't old enough to vote, but I did start to notice that my parents, their political affiliations, their views, their beliefs did start to kind of fall out of step with the Democratic Party. Um, now I think it's safe to say that my parents, myself, and um, possibly even my older siblings are all Republican voters, or we like to affiliate with the Republican Party. Um, But I have every aunt and uncle on my mom's side of the family are all hardcore Democrats. Um, A lot of our family doesn't even know that we are Republican voters, just because they have always known my parents to be Democratic voters. So we kind of not keep it hush hush, but it's just something that 
they um they don't really know that my parents sure. and I vote Republican. Um, but yeah, I definitely see a lot of issues, not so much with like racism or Corona or anything like that, yeah. but with um, the women, the women's right to choose pro-life, pro-abortion. Um, and then honestly, things like social security. Um, I have a lot of family members that are, are old enough to be drawing social security. So I know that's a huge concern of theirs. And I would say things like those are bigger issues that we are divided on amongst my family than things like the coronavirus or racism or stuff like that. Um, those are the ones that kind of stick out to me the most. I will yeah. just echo, um, I think Anna is the one that said it, in St. Louis, um, when the mask mandates came out and people were kind of like forced, quote unquote, forced to wear masks more. Um, that was St. Louis County and St. Louis City. The neighboring county didn't have a mask mandate in place. So what we started seeing were a lot of young Republicans who wanted to still go out to eat or out to the bars, um, who wanted to, quote unquote, live their lives like normal. They were starting to travel across the river to the neighboring county because they could get away with not wearing a mask sure. and they could get away with living their life as yeah. they had been. Um, and I think that kind of plays into, you know, we've been talking about Corona versus the economy. Are they interchangeable? Stuff like that. Um, I would argue that for a lot of younger Republicans in mm -hmm. Missouri, that was a huge concern of theirs. If you take away the restaurant industry and you take away things that we're used to doing on a frequent basis, how is that going to affect the economy? So they were trying to find loopholes to still go out sure. and support these businesses. Yeah still go out and do their normal things without seeing the economy quote unquote tank. So I, yeah, I would no. say that there's a huge divide. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, being from that area, you know, it was definitely, you know, kind of one way or the other, you know, I, I kind of here in Germany being, you know, located here where we have an 8 PM curfew, you know, and things like that. And then I see my buddies in St. Louis that are like, you know, out like, like, you know, normal. So um, I, I want to take this as an opportunity to shift a little bit. Cause I, I started to, you know, I, I told you guys in the beginning, I wanted to look forward a little bit too. So I wanted to focus the attention on the, the, the new 117th Congress that, you know, we, we all just put into place. Um, we saw an increase in the number of women um, and, and, and minorities, but because we're focused on the youth vote, I, I, I wanted to look this up to see. Uh, the average age of a Senate member of the 117th Congress is 64 years old. And the average age of a House member is 58. Grant, is this a problem? I think it is. Um, okay. I think there's, there's something to be said about having people having experience in positions. Um, and, you know, in most career fields, I think by the time you hit that age, you're looking probably at retirement. And I think that's the average age. That's not the oldest people. Right. Um, I think... Not to answer your question with another question, but I think looking sure. at not only the age, but also how long those people have served for their tenure, like it's very interesting to see a lot of the reporting about the freshmen, what they're going to do to work with Biden. I saw a lot of GOP freshmen have agreed, hey, like America United, let's do this, Joe, like we're down. And I yeah. think that's, an, that's a very encouraging thing to see. And I think, I think that's something that the youth likes to see these kind of like the younger, um, you know, the squad in the house, right? It's like sure. these are people that are, they're proposing ideas that are relatively radical. They might not be, they might be, but compared to the other things that are being done in Congress, they are, and they're shaking things up. And I think, um, I guess, representing kind of like the third party voters here, I think it's, it's very interesting and I think it's good. I think having the same people in power for too long is, is never a good thing, right? Um, and th that to be said, like, there are some people that are really good at their jobs, but I think if you look at the majority, um, you know, they're, they're not as many as the people that I think would be better off. Like, hey, let's throw some, some fresh blood into this. Sure, sure. Well, I don't know about you, like, uh, Grant, you've been overseas. Priya, you spent some time over here. And Anna, you are currently. I notice a difference even in like the campaign posters. Um, it just looks different to be a politician in Germany. Like, and maybe that's a very surface level way of me putting that, but like, it just looks different. It looks younger. It looks more modern. Like 
guys are okay with having beards, like hair slick. Like there's all these little indicators that you kind of look like that's a big no, no, you know, in the United States, like this is kind of old school mentality, like black suit, blue tie, you know? And so I, I, to echo what you're saying, uh, you know, I think that that's an interesting point. Anna, you said you have a comment as well. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this. Oh yeah. Just, um, it's not actually Germany related, but just to echo a bit of what Grant said about bringing in some flesh, fresh blood or innovative thought. Um, it reminded me of a podcast episode I'd recently listened to talking about um, how outsiders can sometimes have the, you know, come in with better ideas and experts. Um, and having experience is of course beneficial in a political position, but I think it's imperative that we do get more young representation and people who are gonna, you know, this cliche expression, but think outside of the box because when you do have someone who's been in the same position for 30 plus years, um, the chances that they're gonna be thinking a bit, you know, outdated or they're, they're, that they're not as up to date with what's going on um, as not as representative of the current population is, is high. Um, and I, I just, this sparked me this idea or stuck with me this idea that um, people who, who might think that it's a disadvantage to be new or be an outsider really mm -hmm. can, be, can be gems in this way and come in sure. with something that um, someone who's been there for, for a couple of decades wouldn't have thought of. So yeah, um, just was inspirational. Um, that thing that uh, Ella, me what, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I just wanted to real quickly say that something that stuck out to me about this um, new Congress that's starting is uh, obviously we had AOC come in a few years ago. She was super young. Not only was she young, but she was also female. And I think that no matter what side of the political spectrum you stand on, created huge waves as far as getting these younger faces in there and getting these newer faces. On the flip side of that, we also had um, for this Congress, Madison Cawthorn, who is like the like the youngest, I think he's one of the youngest um, yeah, House he, members. Yeah, I think he's 20, I think 25. I, I'm Hopefully yeah. for our viewers, I, I'm literally pulling that from the back of my head. I don't know, but I think 25 years old, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so you have him on the flip side who is, um, super, super young. And I think that something that I at least noticed once he got um, his ticket or whatever is that there were people from particularly female, but from both sides of the political spectrum that were all of a sudden like, oh, look at him. Like, look at this new face. So not that that's really anything politically based, but I think it, it shows a lot that we are maybe more accepting of these younger newer faces into our political system. Priya, go ahead, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that stands out is how, especially Jacob, to your point about witnessing like elections in Germany and witnessing them in America. I lived in Germany during European parliament elections. Then I lived in Paris during their presidential election where they elected Macron. And I think one of the things that's always interesting to me is this idea of public service is so different um, in Europe versus America. And I think a big thing that contributes to that is the way our election systems are set up, our rules around electoral politics, things from campaign finance reform to media regulations that really sets it up so that only certain people can achieve elected office. And for the longest time in our country's history, that has been rich white men with access to those resources to be able to run for office. And we've seen people like AOC, younger members, people of color get into Congress in these past couple of years. And a big result of that is them being able to access additional resources to run better organizing games and ground games and get money um, funneled into them. And I think them taking the initiative to really change the way we understand public service has really caused a shift. Like I know AOC has said this herself, people like her aren't supposed to get into Congress. She was a working class woman. She was a bartender. She didn't have that pedigree that some people have. She wasn't a career politician. This was her first time running for office, but we see people like that get into elected office in Europe more commonly because of the way elections are set up in a way that it makes it more accessible. And we should be having more everyday people in Congress and not just career politicians or people who have been there for several terms. And I think going back to Anna's point, I think one of the, thing young one of the things young people are really looking for, that think outside of the box mentality, that really big structural change that young people are craving because they've lived under 
so many large life altering historic events that they're like, hey, when are we going to sit down and have a serious conversation about this and pass the measure of legislation that we really need to address this? Yeah, and I think overall, you know, I, regardless of which side of the aisle you were on, I think the idea of, of people being encouraged to be a part of the process is obviously a good thing, regardless of whether that's Republican or, or, or Democratic. Uh, Chris, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here. So firstly, yeah, like Ella was mentioning, Madison Cawthorn, I think he is 25 years old. I think we are starting to see more and more young people transition into the House and, and, and hopefully into the Senate soon. Uh, but I don't have a huge issue with the with the ex levels of experience that are in the House and the Senate. Sure, over time, I'd like to see a shift and, and have younger people start to step up. But I think that there's absolutely something to be said for the leadership in both chambers being of people who have, are experienced and are able to keep keep the uh, keep the bills flowing, keep uh, the American people happy. I mean, the basis of the entire political system in the United States is getting reelected, right? You have to stay popular to get reelected. Yeah. And uh, all the power to Madison Cawthorn and AOC, I don't think that they really care about that so much. They care about getting their ideas passed, right? And mm. for the better or for the worse, it, it, it's not necessarily super realistic in the current structure of the system. So I think that, you know, having more young people integrate in over time is good. Uh, but I definitely think that there, there need to be experienced hands at, at the top of the leadership. So that's why I'm not always opposed to people serving for longer periods of time. I mean, for the most part I am, but it definitely helps when you have someone like the Speaker of the House be someone who is proficient at being a Speaker of the House like Speaker Pelosi is, uh, or having a Senator, a Senate majority or minority leader be as skilled as Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer. So I think there's uh, you know, an issue with age, but I don't have an issue with the experience. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Chris, is like, you know, I, I think in any organization, um, I, I used to be a, 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 I coached in college football for a little while. And we had a guy on staff that said, like, you always have to have an old guy on staff. Like we used to joke about it. But Chris to kind of echoed that. His thought was like, we want someone that's been through all this stuff before that when we get down in like the fourth quarter of a game, I don't want to get too much into a sports analogy with all you people, but he, he wanted someone that's been there and done it 30 times and like keeps everyone calm. So I think Chris, it's an interesting point. Um, I can't believe it's 758. I, 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 I want to focus a couple uh, questions here and then we do have a few that were submitted by the viewers. So uh, one thing I wanted to try, just, you know, we, we are now 24 hours post inauguration of, of, of president uh, Biden and, and vice president Harris. We are it, obviously there's a turning of the page when a new administration comes in, but I think we'd be remiss to not take an opportunity. And I'm going to ask the question in a way that's going to force you into a one word answer. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to come or a couple seconds to create your answer here. But when we look back on President Trump uh, in, in the past four years, uh, I wanted to to see what your guys' thoughts were. What word will come to mind? What one word answer will come to mind when 10 or 15 years down the road, we look back on Trump? What best exemplifies uh, the administration? Um, and maybe it's not even specific to, you know, him as the person, maybe it's the environment in general, but one word that would kind of exemplify you think best uh, what the past four years have been like. Uh, Grant, can you start us off? One word. I think after a year, 2020, the word that I would throw out is unprecedented. I think a lot of firsts came from this presidency. Um, and 2020, I've heard that word more times than I wish to. <laughs> okay. Unprecedented. Priya. I have so many choice words, but I'm just going to go with chaos for now. Okay. Anna. I love that one, Priya. Um, I would say division. Okay, Chris. You're muted still, buddy. Priya. Uh, uh, 
we lose Chris? Can. can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Better? Go ahead. No, I'm you, you good? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay. Priya, you kind of stole mine. <laughs> I, I was also going to say chaos uh, because he was infamously called the chaos candidate in 2016. And I mean, I think that uh, that is definitely a word to describe his presidency. I don't think it was always his fault, right? I mean, I think that it stemmed from his, his leadership style. He delegated a lot to his family members and not necessarily the experts, but I, I mean, I think the chaos is what it comes down to. Okay, Ella. I'm gonna say persevere. Okay, I like that positive attitude, Ella. You need a little bit of that. Okay, so I, I wanna focus on one additional thing and then we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll focus on some questions that, that came from the audience because we have about a half hour left, but. I really do want to take a look at the inauguration yesterday. And there was one thing that stuck out to me as I watched um, at home. Um, President Biden mentioned the word unite. I counted 11 times in his address. So again, first watch 11 times is what I counted. Um, the theme, they kind of put the theme on the inauguration and that was America United. Um, I think regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, there's definitely a, a different tone or, or, or at least a rhetoric from President Biden. But I'm going to make a dad joke here. There's still an elephant in the room. There's actually 74 million of them from the Republican Party that voted for Trump. So my question to you guys, and, and again, I'll try to ask you to maybe keep it under a minute here, because uh, I'd love to get everyone's perspective. But again, just try to keep it kind of condensed. How do you, what does unite look like for 2021 and this new administration? I know that that question's a bit broad, uh, but just some initial thoughts. What would have to happen, um, you know, in your eyes for that to, to, to come true? I think the reality is we're moving forward with a, with a Biden administration here. 17 executive orders signed in the first day, a lot of rollbacks of Trump policies. Uh, we're back into the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, we've defunded the wall, uh, the building of the wall on the southern border. So, Grant, let's start with you. What does Unite look like, or what what would that look like uh, from your perspective? So you, you kind of stole a little bit. I Sorry. wanted to say um, I think uniting is not that everyone is on the same page and agrees, but it's that we're all moving forward in the same direction. We're not marching in step and we're not holding each other's hands and hugging as we go. We've got to stay six feet apart, obviously, but it's that we're kind of at best stumbling, you know, trodden along, jogging. Some people might need a little help. Some people might be in a car and they can pick a couple of people up with them and bring them along. But you're right. I think um, with the signing of a pen, lifestyles changed last night. You know, certain policies are erased. Certain policies are we're back on board again, you know, now we're walking all in the same direction alongside all the other signatories of certain major policies. And so I think to keep it under a minute, um, yeah, we, we don't all have to be, you know, arm in arm, but as long as we're kind of moving along down that road, I think everyone wants to see 2020 in the rear view mirror right now. Okay, Priya, what do you think? I think for me, where I stand is there definitely has to be some accountability if we ever want to reach the point of unity that I think this country aspires to. And I agree. I really see Grant Grant's point making a lot of sense about how, you know, unity doesn't mean that we hold hands and we sing happy songs around a campfire, but, you know, it just means that we have to start taking that next step and that accountability is going to be that first step in holding people responsible for lies and misinformation that they've put out there, holding people responsible for actual lives that have been lost as a result of this administration's policies. That needs to happen as part of that healing process that President Biden has committed himself to. So I think there really needs to be a focus on accountability and really just also addressing this big issue of misinformation that has taken over American democracy and how it's caused us to have many of the structural problems that we're seeing today, we really need to, you know, take a very intentional look at what that role, what the role of misinformation has been in this past election and just this past cycle of politics we've experienced. Anna, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree as well with both Grant and Priya. I also think that 
it starts at the top. It starts with leadership and the rhetorics there. We saw yesterday a lot more of an emphasis on this idea of unity, on the people, on um, upholding the democratic values and what democracy means to the U.S. And I think that we're off to a good start, whether you're Republican or Democrat or somewhere in between, um, to, to be pushed with the message that everyone matters, we're, we're inclusive, we want to include people, um, we, we've gotten rid of an administration, I think, quoting Pompeo from the other day that um, said, we're not about multiculturalism, we're not about different types of people. And I think Biden is, is pushing on the other spectrum to say we are about everyone and we want everyone to be to be valued and respected. And we'll see if, if they are and what happens. But I, I think the, the rhetoric's there and, and it's, uh, that's all we can. Chris, I'd love your perspective as someone who's very much so involved in the Republican side. Um, there, you know, there's a, a certain amount of cynicism that I apply to all to both political parties. You know, I think, but what what would you want to see? I mean, in terms of a uniting of these, um, I love your perspective. Well, there are a few points that, that were mentioned a few seconds ago. Uh, firstly, I mean, the unity. I think it's it was easy for Biden to talk about unity. I think it's going to be much harder than he imagines to actually pursue that on the Republican side. And it, it's not because Republicans are, are stubborn or hard headed, but there is a genuine feeling that Republicans and President Trump, uh, the misinformation that Priya mentioned, there's a lot of feeling on the Republican side that, yeah, people were fed misinformation about President Trump. And I, there are some examples of that being proven true uh, over the last four years. Uh, and obviously not to say that all news media is like that, but there are a few key examples that really shifted the narrative quite a bit. Uh, the Russia uh, investigation was a really key part of it because what we saw was uh, the news media establishment uh, pushing a speculative narrative that while they always tried to clarify it was speculative, came off as reporting at a lot of points. So um, not to say I agree or disagree with any of it, but I think that the effects of that are going to be longstanding within the Republican side. And a lot of those attacks see, feel like they were instigated or encouraged by, by the other side of the aisle. So I, I think that it's going to take more than, I mean, I really think that what it's going to take is it's going to take uh, two fresh nominees in 2024 being able to battle it out fairly and responsibly, uh, someone who didn't face Trump directly, and uh, it's going to take clean campaigns to be run. But, um, you know, I, I think the yeah. other perspective that I was thinking about, you know, specifically when Grant was talking about, you know, we, we, weren't, we aren't always on the same page. I don't think that, we're, we've never always been on the same page, right? But the one thing that we've always been on the same page of, except it feels like in the last 15 years we haven't been, is that America is about freedom and the, you know, mixed culture and diversity and uh, the value of our democratic republic. And I, I think we genuinely had that after September 11th. And I don't know where, how it happened. I think, uh, you know, I don't know where it, it shifted a little bit, but something shifted. Mm -hmm. And I, I think now you have two very different visions for America. I think the difference is that we always were able to disagree on policy, but agree that the, what the true vision for America is. But uh, now I don't even think we, I don't even think we agree on what the true vision of America is anymore. Okay. Ella, what do you think? All right. Well, he literally just stole what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, no, you're fine. About the September 11th, um, for me, unity looks like September 12th, 2001. It looked like the American flags hanging in windows and on front porches, and people didn't care if you were Republican, Democrat, third party. They didn't care if you believed in God, didn't believe in God, like when when the twin towers fell that next day nobody 
the only thing people cared about was that they were safe and in America. And I think unity there, like everybody has pretty much mentioned, there's a lot of moving parts that have to come together before the U.S. will be this like, you know, perfect unison country. But I think that the first small steps that we can do, like Priya mentioned, accountability. Like Grant mentioned, maybe not walking at the same pace, even on the same street right now, but walking in the same direction. And that's going to take people from, from both sides of the political spectrum to, to come together and realize you can have your own beliefs, you can have your own thoughts, but at the end of the day, we are still all American. And I think that's what unity needs to look like. How long that's going to take to get there, I don't know, but sure. hopefully that's where it ends up soon. Well, I think ultimately, you know, before we shift to Q&A from the audience, I think we, we are. Uh, I would hate to put words in all the panelists' mouth, but I love the idea, at least the, 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 the concept of us trying to find a way to work together. Um, and maybe maybe that's too fluffy and, and cute and that's not in the realm of working out. But I think um, to echo what all of you said, there's a lot of moving parts. There really is. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of uh, what that looks like and, and, and moving forward. Um, we'll see. I mean, that's, I guess that's the one thing is we will find out what this will look like. Uh, we will find out what uh, the 117th Congress will be able to do. Uh, and will ultimately uh, what Biden's vision is uh, for his particular administration. Um, we have about a little less than 20 minutes. Um, I have some questions from the audience that I'd like to, to, to tee up to a few of you. Um, Let's start with this one, because I think this is interesting. Chris mentioned earlier, and I can just tell Chris by by kind of uh, how you roll it off the tongue. It was uh, uh, I, I spent a lot of time on 538 and reading those, you know, kind of projections that were coming out for the for the um, for the election. We had a, a member of the uh, the audience ask. Um, I'm interested in hearing the group's take on youthful voters comfort level and sharing openly their viewpoints and political preferences. A uh, ton of concerns have been raised and, uh, and that people are hesitant uh, potentially to express which way they lean out of fear of being judged, or maybe it's a blanket categorization. Um, and a lot of people claim that's why polls are ineffective. Uh, if, if you aren't uh, a polling um, kind of nerd or junkie like myself, uh, it, again, kind of unprecedented. We saw it in 2016 with a lot of the polling, but definitely again in 2020, um, we were seeing Biden favored by sometimes 10 or 12 points. And then you see some of those races come back and they're tight one point, you know, and sometimes I think probably should have been uh, too, too close to call, you know, from that standpoint. Grant, do you think there's any of, of this kind of, I think that the term that 538 called it was shy Trump voters, um, but we don't, it doesn't have to be specifically about Trump. Do you think that we um, have some concerns about sharing our viewpoints? I think the interesting thing about sharing viewpoints and then the relation to polls and talking about elections from 2000 to 2020 is that we've seen a lot of changes in society. So I remember like with the dawn of Twitter, people posting that they're eating a sandwich and an iced coffee for lunch. It was like, who cares about that? And now it's almost like a natural thing. People will just snap a picture, post it. That's like what Instagram is. And so We've become a society that shares almost everything now, but we've also become a society that like when you share almost everything, you're sharing a lot of the political things that there, there used to be like sacred topics that you don't talk about if you go over to someone's house for dinner. Right. And it's like right. politics, religion, certain other things that it's almost like a taboo in American society. Um, and I think, I think you're right. Um, but I think it's, it's very it's just, it's hard to say because I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone. Um, sure, and, sure. and my background in the military is, is very, it's very different too, because we are a part of the executive branch. We serve at the pleasure of the president, but at the same time, we, we largely remain apolitical in our duties. Um, sure. And specifically like the Hatch Act for, forbids us from campaigning. And so it limits what we can say, which becomes extremely difficult in a you know, when you have an incumbent president, someone who's coming back again, and the, the commander in chief is running for president. So, you know, we have to get sat down and make sure that 
the service members understand these rules. I understand. But coming, from, yeah. coming from that community, it's, it's very different. And it's, it's a weird thing to be representing, you know, the, the libertarian, the third party vote, which is very much about like personal freedom and I, you <laughs> stay away from me and I can do yeah, whatever yeah. I want. And coming from a background where it's like, you, you don't have, you know, it's, that's almost like the most probably understandable thing I think for German people is the like, we just do our duty and that's our thing. And, um, and that's been, it's been very interesting to see how that works. And, and I think it's very hard to blanket that, to say that some people are afraid to share because, <laughs> you know, everyone's got that relative that they're friends with on Facebook that isn't afraid <laughs> to share anything. And so I think, yeah. I think you're seeing it stretch where in society we were probably like a little bit this middle. I think people are like, I don't, I'm not going to tell anyone or they're like, my entire Facebook is dedicated as live streaming politics 24 um, seven. And I think that's an interesting thought because when I was growing up, I think politics was ever present. We've always had the 24 hour news cycle since I can remember being, you know, old enough to know what that meant. And so it's always there, but now it's almost like omnipresent. I have five devices that politics is coming at me from and you know, working in, in a media related job. It's again, it's, it's always there. Um, and so it's hard to, to remove yourself or to kind of share these things openly in, in, in this age. And we'll see where we go from there because, I, you know, we've, we've seen some radical decisions by social media companies, private yeah, firms. Yeah, 100 percent. I had a question. I didn't have enough time to get to it. I, maybe I'll just share the stat with everybody just so you guys can kind of get an idea. You know, I wanted to shed some light on kind of the role of social media and, and those types of things. But um, I was interested. Pew Research poll did a, did a poll in which they said. 66% of social media users um, are using a social networking site to engage in some sort of civic or political activity. And that's two thirds. Um, and I, I would really be curious to see what that number looked like, say in 2012, you know, 2016. It's way different now from that perspective. Um, so Grant, thanks, thanks for your feedback on that. Um, we got another question here I think would be interesting. Chris, I'm gonna kind of ping this one towards you, okay? It says, uh, over the next four years, do you think the Republican Party is going to focus on going uh, the way that they put it, quote, back to the basics or carry on with Trumpism? This is something that uh, I really am interested in seeing how the GOP moves forward. You, um, I think if you take the, what happened on the 6th of January, that kind of shifted entirely the GOP strategy um, and I think, you know, I read multiple reports that they're kind of, there's some division within the party, uh, even in, in, in yeah. DC right now, which way they would like to go. What do you think? Uh, what, what's the strategy moving forward here? Well, I, I think there's two things to keep note of, right? You have the establishment government Republicans, the Senate, the House, the leadership in both of those from the GOP side, but then you have the RNC. And the RNC is composed of basically Trump handpicked who was going to be on the RNC when he ran and, and when he ran for reelection. So the RNC, I mean, I don't know if you ever saw the reports, but the, on January 6th, he called into an RNC meeting uh, and he was greeted with applause. And any member of the RNC who didn't uh, applaud for him or spoke out against him got ostracized by the rest of the committee. Um, now, I, I think that that's a temporal moment. I don't think that's going to last very long, uh, especially now that Trump is in Florida and he's, he's going to be there for a while. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to it, does Trump run again or not? Uh, because mm. there is a lot of, cons of people who really think that he will. I'm of the personal opinion that he seriously is considering running again. In his speech yesterday before departing for Florida, he said, we will be back in some forms, kind of flirting with the presidency once again. Uh, but moving forward, I think 2022 is going to be the year to redefine the party if it happens. And I think that the forces, uh, I mean, there were 75 million people who voted for President Trump. Right. Um, right. Sorry. Uh, can you see me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay. Okay. There were 75 million people who voted for President Trump, right? But I really think about half of that are actually the hardcore Trump people, okay? I think the other half of that are people who flipped a coin, said, I still would prefer the Republican over the Democrat, and went that way. 
So I, I think that, uh, you know, it seems like from the media perspective that Trumpism has the advantage, but I really don't think that's the case. Uh, I think that the way that people like Senator Ted Cruz, who was once the front runner for 2016, uh, Senator Hawley, who's also flirted yeah. with the presidency in 2024, the way they have been ostracized for throwing red meat towards the base and objecting to these certifications, uh, I think it's telling of the future of the party. And I think with the speech that Mitch McConnell was comfortable giving on January 6th on the Senate floor, I think it shows, you know, where the party is probably heading. So I, I think that we are headed back to the basics. Uh, I think that Republicans, I think that Republicans, at least young Republicans who I've interacted with, have adopted the mindset, we need small government everywhere. There shouldn't be government getting super heavily involved in social issues. That mm -hmm. should be left for society to figure out. And we need to adopt that mindset to every function of our government. And so that's the way young people are coming up. The young Republicans are more socially liberal than they used to be. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm very socially liberal and I'm the chairman of the Indiana high school Republicans, right? So we're moving in that d different direction. So, you know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but I think probably two years from now and definitely 10 years from now, we're going to be at that point that we're back to the basics. Well, I think an argument could be made, Chris, in the sense that like, you know, you, I was reading some people that were saying, you know, Republicans really outperformed what they were expected to both in both the House and the Senate. And so there was this interesting right. conversation that was starting to sprinkle across kind of uh, the Republican side, which was like, did he maybe even hurt us in some of these areas? Because we're having Senate and House seats where Republicans are really performing well, but he, you know, that Trump's not performing so well. So I think it, to, to kind of just echo your point, it's going to be really interesting to see kind of what happens with that in terms of how you're, you know, what's the attraction level that the party can bring towards those people that were big kind of Trump supporters. Um, so thanks for your feedback, Chris. Well, uh, real quickly, yeah. real quickly to your point about, you know, him out outperforming Biden in some areas. I don't know if I would classify that as Trump winning them so much as the Democrats losing them. For instance, uh, in my in the Miami Dade area, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had the Cuban Americans switch from, you know, Democratic to Republican largely in a response to the squad and the increased sure. chatter of socialism, whether that's, you know, fair or not, that's what happened. So I don't know if that's really, if we can attribute that to Trump or if it would be attributed to the democratic messaging, democratic messaging's own detrimental features. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do one, one more, one word question or one word question, one word answer. Uh, we had one that I think is interesting that it, it's been a lot of discussion about this recently, and obviously uh, kind of a reflection of the past two elections where we saw candidates um, that balance between popular vote and electoral college. And we've seen this discussion about like, hey, is this electoral college? What's going to happen with this? There's been a few whispers uh, that that may be uh, kind of a part of the agenda moving forward. So I just want to outdated or not outdated electoral college system. I'm not even going to let you answer any further, but you, is it okay? Or do you think it needs a change? Uh, Ella, we'll start with you. I think it's okay. Okay. Priya? 100% abolish the electoral college. It's outdated. Okay. Grant? I don't really have a good answer. I would say <laughs> I'm going to abstain. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's okay. Anna, go ahead. I'd say it's time for an update. Okay. Chris? Um, not outdated. Okay. I know that I, I'm not giving you guys enough time there to answer that. I totally understand. Um, I, for, for our viewers, I, I really do think that that, I think you're going to hear more discussion about that process uh, in regards to the electoral college. Um, I, I, was a part of election night coverage here for the DAZ and trying to explain that to someone from Germany is just like the Da Vinci code. Uh, it just doesn't, you know, it's, it's like, well, wait a second. How does this, you know, so you really need some context there um, um, from, from, from that perspective. Um, you know what guys, I, it's eight twenty four. Um, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for, for, for Marion here. I can't express 
enough how great this was. Um, really, really cool to get a chance to to hear from people who are going through uh, experiencing this, uh, this this new administration and the past election um, in a very unique way. So I, I can't thank you enough, Grant, Priya, Anna, Ella, Chris. Uh, great to have a chance to talk with you. Um, for our audience members at home, I hope you took something out of this. I apologize if, if we didn't get a chance to get to your questions. Um, but we did our best. We hummed through as much as we could uh, in an hour and a half. So um, I just want to say thanks to everyone. And, and Marion, we'll, we'll kind of kick it back to you for any closing remarks. And uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Um, I can just add to that and maybe repeat what you said. I'm really happy that all of you joined us um, today, tonight, wherever you are. Um, thanks to you, Jacob, of course, for taking the time and for preparing these questions. I think it was a very great uh, event and discussion. And um, to all of the young voters, um, especially, thank you for agreeing. I know you all have like different um, time schedules and just thank you for making this all happen. To um, talk about, you know, I really like what you said about what unity can look like. Um, how we can find ways to approach one another and at least walk in the same direction. I really like that. Um, despite having different views, different, you know, approaches, I think that's in these times really important. Um, so thanks so much again for all of your perspectives. I also want to thank the Landeszentrale für politische Bildung again for joining us and of course all of you at home um, for watching. It's been great to have you. And so that's it for today. We will be back next Monday um, at 7 p.m. our time, where we are going to continue talking about the um, U.S. election, about the inauguration especially. We have the um, political expert Professor Bierling, who is going to give um, a talk in German about, um, you know, reflecting about the past four years under President Trump, but then also talking about what the future under a President Biden will look like. So we hope that you will all join us then. Um, if you um, need to find out how to register, you can look um, on our uh, website. And so thanks again for everything and um, good day or good night to everyone. <laughs>